Today I really like to convey to all of you, as was mentioned previously, the power of our passion and how when our heart lead us, leads us, it's easier for others to want to help us accomplish our goals. So do you think your passion can affect your career and ultimately your future? I do. Actually, I think passion is contagious. And once we know what we want to accomplish and we're able to visualize our ultimate goal, it's easier for people to determine whether they also want to accomplish these goals. And eventually, there's times when those passions become their passion and we're able to accomplish our ultimate goals. So the question is, that sounds really easy, everyone talks about passion, but how do you find that driving passion? For me, it was a combination of innate curiosity and personal experience. I can vividly think back to when I was four years old and my sister comes home from the hospital after having reconstructive surgery for a cleft lip that she was born with. And instead of being shocked or scared or disgusted, I just kept on asking why. Why does she have that? Why don't I have that? Why did that happen? Is it something that we did? And thinking back, that was my first scientific question at the age of four. So it's really no surprise that I decided to become a scientist, and specifically a scientist in biomedical research, because I was intrigued by disease and the mechanisms that drive those diseases. So I became a PhD student at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. And my first project was looking exactly at that, at looking at genes that drive human disease, but in a, more, in a very simple way. So essentially what we did, we looked at large families that had hereditary diseases, and we tried to assess what were the genes that were driving those diseases in those families. For me, it was exactly what I wanted. I wanted to be connected to the patients. I wanted to do translational research, but, Again, a personal experience had me asking the question, why? And this time, it was an unfortunate diagnosis of my aunt and my cousin. They were both diagnosed with advanced stage ovarian cancer. And the two immediate emotions there were actually shock and sadness. Shock, because if we were to review the literature on ovarian cancer, there was very little known at that time in terms of the genes that were driving the disease. And on top of that, there were not many drugs currently available to treat those cancers, aside from the initial chemotherapies. And obviously there was sadness. Sadness because if you look at the statistics of women diagnosed with ovarian cancer at that stage, many of them do not live past five years. So there is really the trigger of my ultimate passion, which is what I'm trying to accomplish almost every day. And that is to make impactful scientific discoveries so that we can ultimately help every woman diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Once again, that sounds very broad and very simple. So I was very fortunate in 2012 to be recruited to Case Western Reserve University, which is right down the street. I was recruited by Dr. Stan Gerson, who is the Cancer Center Director. And at that time, there was really no translational research labs working in ovarian cancer, but we knew it was a very deadly disease and there were a lot of patients. So what can we do about it? So he recruited me there and I was obviously extremely excited. I started my research lab, I started working on projects, but it was really lonely because there were no other scientists working in that field. And in order to make an impact, especially on a cancer that's not extremely common, there's only about 25,000 cases a year, we needed to collaborate. So my motto was, if you build it, they would come. All right. So what did I want to build? So the, essentially the goal was to be able to collect tumors from every single woman that was diagnosed with gynecological cancer, which includes ovarian cancer as well as endometrial cancer, and with those tumors, collect both blood and the tumor and be able to do genetic profiling, develop cell lines, and mouse avatars. 
So you probably never thought we would be a mouse, right? Our avatars are going to be mice. But in this situation, we we're able to grow a patient's tumor in the backside of a mouse. And in the, as I get on with the story, I'll kind of describe what we've been able to do with that. So we luckily were able to start this. But I'm one person, and that's a huge goal. How was I going to make this happen? I needed to bring together oncologists, surgeons, pathologists, computational biologists, and most importantly, patients. And the only way we can make this happen is if you engage the patient and you ultimately show them what your vision is and that that vision is coming from your heart. So what we do, and I continuously do, even at Michigan, we bring patients into the lab. We get to show them maybe sometimes their tumor, a tumor of another woman, but they get to see that we're doing research on something that's extremely relevant to them with the hope that eventually, if their tumor comes back, we will have a better idea of what drugs to treat their tumors with. The other part of bringing them in is we empower patients. Because that, you could imagine being diagnosed with such a disease, you feel like you've lost all hope. But when they see that there's tons of trainees in the lab working on these cells that are straight out of the OR, it makes them feel like they're empowered and they can control their destiny. It also helps, which was, a, you know, I hadn't thought of this when I first started, the trainees. I have so many students come to me in shock after meeting a patient. Because a lot of PhD students mainly spend their time in a the lab. They don't go to the clinical side. And when they actually see these patients and realize the cells that they're working on every day are actually, actually have a name and are from a person, it changes their passion, it changes their dedication. And that's ultimately getting to the point of you gotta show them. It's all about knowing your vision and then allowing other people to see that vision and to show that you can have an, make an impact in the world and it's feasible. So um, how, in the end, what we try to do in the lab is essentially our heart drives the science, but our passion drives the data. Because if you're not passionate about the work you do, especially you younger kids, it's very hard to stick with it. Many of you, if you are going into college, and I'm not saying you're gonna find your passion immediately, but you have to care about what you're doing. It could even be the simplest thing. Um, it's just essential in terms of succeeding. And then you'll see people will tend to help you out more too, if you're passionate about what you do. Okay, so what do we do with these samples now? So it's been six years. We, did, we uh, collected about 350 patient tumors and made about 50 of these mouse avatars. But really, people are not gonna continuously contribute if we don't show them that this matters. So here's where I just wanna highlight where cancer treatment was and where it's going and why it's important to have the type of tumor bank that we made. So in the past, and even currently for some cancers, traditionally, a patient comes in, their tumors are, look, sorry, their tumors are examined under the microscope by a pathologist, and then that pathologist determines, number one, what type of tumor it is, number two, how aggressive it is, and then the oncologist dictates what chemotherapy to give. Typically, it would be just be a chemotherapy that targets all fast-growing cells, so, and that's why you tend to get a lot of toxicities because it's not specific to the tumor, it's to any cell that's growing quickly. So nowadays, now that DNA sequencing and the development of mouse avatars is becoming a routine, the way that we treat patients is different. So we collect tumors, we also collect the DNA, so blood from the DNA, and we make these mouse avatars, sorry. We make these mouse avatars um, and the hope is that in combination with the pathologist, which, who always is essential in the process, in combination with the genetic information that we learn from DNA sequencing, and then with the mouse avatars, we'll be able to develop a more personalized treatment regimen for all cancer patients. Oh, sorry. Here we go. And the beauty of that is what we've been able to show is that um, these mouse avatars are able to predict whether a patient will respond to a certain chemotherapy. 
The problem is right now, as I mentioned, this new model, it sounds great, but it's not actually feasible at this time in terms of the use of mouse avatars because it takes about three to four months for the tumors in a mouse to grow. And a patient is not going to wait two to four months to know what chemo to go on. So really what we're using these mouse avatars up for are to run mouse clinical trials. And essentially we have pharma companies approach us. They have a new drug that they're interested in developing and moving on to clinical trials. But they don't wanna treat all patients. They wanna first know which patients would respond best. So what we do is take our panel of mouse avatars, which is you know, a representation of the patients, and see which of those mouse avatars respond to the chemo and which don't. And try to understand what are the genetic features of those tumors that respond. So now, moving forward into clinical trials, we'll be able to know what patients should be treated with these new drugs. And what that has amassed is actually patients are now more inclined to go on to clinical trials. So it's shocking, but only 15% of adult cancer patients are on, go on to clinical trials. A lot of that is fear, a lot of that is that it's unknown side effects, but now that they know these types of studies are being done, and that the drug is more specific to their gene, or in their, the gene in their tumor, we've seen an uptick in patients that enroll in clinical trials. So ultimately, Developing this is not only helping me in the research lab finding new drugs, but it's also helping the clinicians treat their patients better. So as I said, it's now been six years, we've collected all these samples, and the best part of it is that we have now, from one lab working in ovarian cancer, we have about 15 that now have at least one research project focused in ovarian cancer. And beyond that, we've gotten funding from the government, from industry, as well as from philanthropic efforts to build this program. So in the end, as I mentioned before, I think if you build it, they will come. So the other people that come is also this, the recruiter. So I was recruited because of this effort to University of Michigan. Luckily, this program is still going on in Cleveland, but um, I moved to Michigan in July with the hopes of expanding their already existing program and my goal, now a new goal, is to com combine the two programs. As I mentioned, it's a, a fairly um, rare cancer, so we need to bring together as many people as we can. So my goal now is to combine both the Cleveland and Ann Arbor group to, be, to make it a more impactful uh, resource and also make more impactful um, studies. So this now brings me on to you guys. So can my passion or the passion of your mentors affect you? Affect the youngest generation, those kids that maybe lack the confidence or unsure what they wanna do, um, don't think they have the opportunities or don't have the opportunities. And really, my mentoring high school students is really where I saw how contagious passion is. So as was mentioned, um, Several years ago, we developed a foundation called the Young Scientist Foundation. And the mission of this foundation was to bring high school students into a biomedical research lab, especially those students that didn't necessarily have those opportunities throughout the year, or who otherwise couldn't work in a research lab because they needed to have a summer job. And most times working in a research lab, it's volunteer. And through that program, I was able to meet obviously many, many intelligent, motivated students, but I'm just gonna tell you one story because I think it was for me the best example of how, how I do my work can affect all of you. And so this is a story of Olga Kovalenko. She went to Mayfield Heights High School and I met her mom, a chance encounter at a local store. And I had just moved here and I mentioned, and, and she was doing something, she was, she was a tailor at a store, so she was tailoring my dress and I mentioned I moved here to work, to start my research lab. And she reminded me a lot of my parents. So she's first, she's from Russia. I'm not from Italy, but she's the first generation here. And she mentioned her daughter. And her daughter is very interested in becoming a scientist or a doctor, but doesn't have the confidence to explore it and doesn't think she'll ever achieve that goal. So I remember that feeling of handing her my business card and saying, you know what, have Olga contact me. 
Regardless of her research background, I'll be happy to take her in the lab. I did not hear from Olga for a year. I thought, okay, this was a nice gesture, I'm never gonna hear from her. She then started a case, and what she told me, she was just about to go work at the Botanical Gardens because she, she needed a job to support herself and her mom. And on that day, she decided to email me, luckily, because it's now been five and a half years. She's been on six publications. She got into medical school at Case and is now in her third year of med school. And to this day, she still doesn't think she deserves it. And the only reason she thinks she's where she's at is because she had an example of someone who had a dream, who may not have had the pedigree, may not have had the background, but knew what they wanted. So what I give you the advice is look for those mentors. Look for someone you want to emulate and be like, if they can do it, I can do it, regardless of age, anything, right? That's what you need. And the interesting thing about Olga as well, I just found out, because she needs to go decide what specialty she wants to go into, she's gonna, she, her goal is to become a gynecological oncologist. Ultimately, because of the patients she met when she was in the research lab, she wants to try to treat those same patients in med school or as a, as a physician. So what I try to leave you with, guys, is I hope that all of you find your passion. And you ask yourself every day, is that passion driving your decisions? And make sure it comes from the heart and not what you should do, but what you want to do. Because when you're doing what you want to do, you'll do it great. And I'm going to end that back.